So salt is kind of interesting because um, it is uh, something that does blend in with water. It's, it's hydrophilic. But the reason for being hydrophilic doesn't have to do with polarity. Because if we think about the constituents of salt, so say we take table salt, okay? We have sodium over here and we have chloride over here, okay? And we look at their, their actual um, electron shells and kind of look at all these. We have this internal shell that's full, this next shell that's totally full, it's got eight. And then this next shell here, you can see it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's actually only missing one. Whereas we can comp compare that then to sodium, we can see that, that it actually has two full shells, but its outer shell only has one. So actually sharing this one is a good deal for chlorine, but is not a good deal for sodium, okay? Because it's still pretty far away from having, having this full outer shell. So it's not really a good deal, deal for them. So that's not really an option. But instead, the better thing for them to do is to simply exchange and have that sodium donate that electron to chlorine. And if they do that, then of course this guy is now totally full. It's perfectly happy. And this one actually also has, oops, also has these full valent shells because it now doesn't have that extra one in terms of the outer one in sodium. But what's actually happened in this donation process is these have become what are called ions. And so ions are charged atoms. That's all they are. And so specifically, we have sodium, which actually is what becomes a cation, and it's positively charged. And of course, it's positively charged because those electrons are negative. And so if it gets rid of one electron, one electrical charge, then it actually becomes positive. Whereas chlorine actually becomes an anion because it actually takes on one of those electrons and becomes um, a charge of negative one. And so because these ions, this cation and this anion, are positively and negatively charged, they also tend to attract. And that attraction is what we call this ionic bond. It's clearly a little bit weaker than the covalent bond because there's nothing physically holding them together. They're not sharing those electrons, but they are attracted to each other because of this difference in charge, because they've become ions. So we can then kind of recap and think a little bit about um, what allows things to dissolve in water and what, in, in what cases they maybe wouldn't dissolve in water. So we have this table here that tells us a little bit of kind of what we've learned so far. So the things that do dissolve in water are things that have polar covalent bonds, or perhaps they have ionic bonds, and we call these things hydrophilic. And this is in opposition for things that actually don't dissolve in water, which is substances with nonpolar covalent bonds, like that oil, um, things without a charge, and we call these hydrophobic. So the last thing I wanted to introduce was this idea of soap, because in many cases you're thinking to yourself, well, I take water and I take oil and I've had many experiences trying to get those things off of my pans. And how do we do it? Well, we always introduce some soap. And so we can think a little bit about why soap is so useful in trying to get some of that oil off of our pans. Well, soap actually has a very um, compatible structure, very similar to something we've already seen. You can clearly see it has this kind of hydrophilic end over here and then a hydrophobic end, which looks very similar to those phospholipids that we actually saw in a whole bunch of those membranes earlier in the semester. And so it really has this really interesting structure. And that's actually what's called ampopathic, okay, which means that ampa means it has both. It has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Okay, and we can kind of think about why is that, that it's actually such an interesting and useful uh, molecule. Well, if we take oil and water, as we can see on the left um, and the right, and we say, okay, well, what happens if we go ahead and we actually add some of this soap, which you can see that blue liquid that we're pouring in to the left. We go ahead and we take both those, those jars and we shake them up, we put them down and we let them sit for a second. Well, hopefully you can kind of guess what's gonna actually happen. As you can see, the oil and the water is gonna separate just like we've already seen. But when we add the soap, the oil and water actually seem to mix well. And contrary to what those kind of soaps often will tell you, it's not as though they're actually breaking down the oils at all, but instead what they're actually doing is they're surrounding those particular things like oil with these amphipathic molecules, which then allows them to be water soluble and they can then wash away, wash down the drain. And so we can kind of see that chemistry can be really, really useful, um, not only for kind of biological molecules, but kind of understanding how all these things work in your everyday life.